Welcome to the Rural African Society's 120th anniversary lecture. Uh, just to let you know, we are being recorded and we are live streaming now on Facebook. It is a real pleasure for me to join you today. I'm Nick Cheesman, the Professor of Democracy at the University of Birmingham for three reasons. The first is that the events that you will hear about today from Dr. Nicola Westcott, Nicholas Westcott in just a moment are events I played a very tiny part in as the editor of African Affairs, the journal of the Royal African Society, which we'll be talking about in part amongst many bigger issues in a moment. The second reason I'm delighted to be here is that I think this event, along with many others that are taking place around now, will really cast a much needed look at the histories of our own prized institutions and reveal that many of our own institutions and the ones that we value most in the study of Africa today have their own murky pasts that need to be exposed, explored, discussed and decolonized. And thirdly, I'm excited to be here today because we have two particularly interesting speakers. Uh, the first, uh, Dr. Nicholas Westcott, the director of the Royal African Society, is someone who I've enjoyed having discussions with for many years and always enjoyed his pieces, which are always insightful. Um, and the discussant today, uh, Professor Fulmi uh, Olin Sagakin, uh, Vice President and Vice Principal, King's College London, uh, someone whose work I've always found to be particularly insightful and particularly worth reading. We're going to start with Dr. Nicholas Westcott, who's going to give us uh, his thoughts, and then we're going to go to uh, Professor Fumi as the discussant. So uh, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, and without further ado, over to you, Nick. Thank you very much, Nick. And uh, I, I want to uh, thank both of you, you and Fumi, for joining us today. Uh, this year is the 120th anniversary of the Royal African Society. This is something worth celebrating, but also worth examining. Obviously, relations between Britain and Africa have changed dramatically in that time, as has the society itself. And in some ways, they reflect each other. But this is complex and indeed contested historical territory. So I underline this is very much a personal perspective. But I'll try and do three things. Describe what the society has been doing and saying. Secondly, explain those changes over time, particularly since independence and thirdly set out an agenda for the future. Reading through 120 years worth of the Society's journal, that's around 700,000 pages, is very illuminating and rather time consuming. But it underlined the journal's historical value as a source on changing British attitudes towards Africa. The full story will be published in the anniversary edition of African Affairs in October this year. Uh, so this is only a brief glimpse of what's contained there. It will my lecture will show that from the outset, the society gave space to African voices from Africa, but that these disappeared after 1914 as the society was absorbed into the wider British imperial project. But they resurfaced again in the 1940s, growing louder up to independence. But in the 60 years since independence, the society has changed again from being predominantly a British voice about Africa to being a platform for the African voice in Britain, and this is what points the way to the future. The African Society, which was its original name, it only became royal in 1936, was founded in 1901 in memory of Mary Kingsley. She was an unusual Victorian traveler in Africa. She came neither to preach nor to rule, nor actually to explore, but to listen, to listen to how Africans saw their own world. And she reflected this in two books, that caused a sensation when they were published in the 1890s. But she died in 1900 of a fever while looking after Boer uh, prisoners of war in South Africa at the age of 36. And the society was founded in her memory on the 27th of June, 1901. Two of the largest donations to support the founding of the society came from Africans, from R.B. Blaise, uh, a merchant in Lagos, and E.W. Blyden, a Liberian, who was working for the British administration in Freetown, Sierra Leone. Blyden uh, has been revered by African nationalists, by Nkrumah, by Azikwe, but has been nearly forgotten now. But he was actually a vice president of the society, and he published articles mainly on education in its journal before he died in 1912. He saw, as Chinua Achebe described 50 years later in Things Fall Apart, that traditional African social structures were decaying rapidly under European rule. 
and that what was needed was not their preservation, but their transformation. So a number of Africans were directly involved in the founding of the society, contributing money, sitting on the council, attending meetings, publishing this journal. And in the latter, it wasn't just Blyden, but it was Pixley Ka Isaka Seme, who founded the organization that became the ANC. And there were contributors from Ghana, Ethiopia, Nigeria, Malawi, and even Booker T. Washington from the US, published in the journal. In 1913, a meeting for African students in the UK drew 40 African participants. Uh, and in 1906, one of the first presidents of the society, Sir Harry Johnston, expressed the hope that, quote, Africans may not only equal, but exceed our European members. And that shortly all educated Africans will cooperate uh, in making Africa well known in Britain. But it was not to be. As Mary Kingsley's friends died or departed and its finances became more precarious, the society turned into a more exclusively imperial affair, strongly imbued with the ideology of the time. From 1914 to 1944, African authors almost completely disappeared from the journal and African speakers from the platform. The society gave the occasional reception, grand reception for the Sultan of Zanzibar in 1929, for example, but that reinforced rather than undermine the African stereotype. The society's original objectives were the examination of, quote, many subjects in Africa, such as racial characteristics, labor, disease, currency, banking, education, and political and industrial conditions. And the journal was to be the best and most reliable source of reference on all African subjects. But this knowledge production about Africa was not a disinterested exercise. Its objective was to understand Africa in order to enhance the success of British rule. And the purpose of that rule, according to Lord Averbury, who was one of the second presidents of the society in 1902, and I quote this not to give any offense, but just to illustrate very clearly what the attitudes of the time were. So the purpose of British rule, he said, was, quote, to secure for the natives the inestimable blessings of freedom, justice, and peace the partition of Africa, which was only 18 years before, may be justified, but only if the nations of Europe regard their position as a sacred trust, if they endeavor to lift the black ball, which so long overshadowed the dark continent, and to brighten the lot of the unfortunate natives, for so many ages, the victims of tyranny and oppression, but for whom we may venture to hope that brighter times are now in prospect." Unquote. It would be hard, to find a more succinct summary of the imperial ideology. The denigration of pre-colonial Africa as barbarous and uncivilized, the glossing over of the violence of colonial occupation, the assertion of a civilizing mission based on the unquestioned moral and material superiority of Western civilization, and the justification of colonial rule as a form of, quote, trusteeship, unquote. That quote has it all. In the interwar years, the heyday of empire, Articles of the journal discussed the people, the languages, and the resources of Britain's new possessions on the continent. But the society was in many ways an illustration of Edward Said's argument in Orientalism about knowledge being in the service of power, entrenching the inequality between ruler and ruled, defining the terms of what knowledge was regarded as valid and useful. At its regular monthly dinners, the society entertained a parade of colonial governors, colonial secretaries, Winston Churchill was there waxing lyrical about the economic benefits of Africa to Britain, and Leo Amory encouraging white settlement. And even in 1926, they hosted the Prince of Wales. In that same year, 1926, the society dropped Mary Kingsley from its logo and replaced her with a map of Africa. The focus was very largely on how to rule Africa and to develop it as an economic asset. But even so, there were debates within the society about the nature that colonial or that imperial rule. One argument was over white settlement. Early settlers shared an assumption that the British had effectively a God-given right to migrate and settle wherever they wanted. This is somewhat ironic given their successors' de determination to deny that same right to the descendants of those they once ruled. But the settlers sought to keep Africans separate, quote, respecting, unquote, Africans, quote, different traditions, unquote but in practice, confining them to inferior land and to social and material subordination. Others in the society argued in the spirit of Mary Kingsley that African interests should be put first 
and settlers second, if not excluded altogether. And this debate gave rise to a succession of articles or speeches on, quote, the native problem in country X or Y. This was also, the same issues were reflected in the debate over education, whether Africans should have a, quote, appropriate, unquote, education based on manual, technical, or agricultural skills, or be allowed to have a European style literary education, which, as a number of district officers observed, seemed to be what the Africans themselves wanted. Many colonial officials reflected a deep suspicion of, quote, the educated native, unquote, whose ideas of equality challenged the colonial order. In effect, in the 1920s and 30s, the Afri emerging African middle class was marginalized beneath a de facto color bar that in, in effect hastened the emergence of African nationalism. But unusually, in 1934, the journal published an article on education by an African, a man called Namdi Azikiwe, called, How Shall We Educate the African? And I quote, he said, the African is human and is intellectually alert, just as the average European, Asiatic, or American. What he needs is an opportunity to demonstrate his capabilities. Education knows no race or color or creed. The African is not and never has been a problem. There is no such thing as an African educational problem. Those who believe in such an oddity are the problems themselves. As EQA returned to West Africa and became the editor of the West African Pilot, pioneering nationalist newspaper, and in 1960 was the first president of independent Nigeria. The third area of argument was over indirect rule using native authorities as colonial intermediaries. Anthropologists were often recruited to implement this, but proved subversive because by their discipline, they listened to what Africans said. Lucy Mayer, one of the pioneering anthropologists, told the society that Africans demonstrated exactly the same characteristics of economic individualism and enterprise as Europeans. And Marjorie Perham, not an anthropologist, but she listened, pointed out that it was hard to base indirect rule on African structures that were in a state of constant flux. Africans were even more blunt. One participant in a debate in the 1930s about indirect rule condemned it for causing, quote, the divorcement of the people from their chiefs and elders who had become mere agents of colonial government and attacked the concept of trusteeship itself as, quote, a weariness to the people and a camouflage to rob them of their freedom and liberty of speech. So they were told. But the dis this discussion also highlights the important role that women played in society from its foundation. As well as the friends of Mary Kingsley, by 1908, there were 60 female members. Okay, that was about 10% of the total, but this was the old days and that was quite a lot. Sorry. The, uh, Africans, uh, one of the leading African linguists of the day was Alice Werner, and she became one of the editors of uh, the Society's Journal, as well as one of the founding members of what became the School of Oriental and African Studies in 1920. She promoted Swahili uh, poetry in the journal and histories that Africans themselves were writing of their own continent back in the 1920s, but hers was a lonely voice. The situation was transformed for Africa, for Britain, for the society by the Second World War. In 1944, a journalist and broadcaster, Henry Swansea, became editor of what was now renamed African Affairs, the name the journal has to the present day. And it took a new direction, focusing on politics and current affairs and beginning to restore the African voice that had been lost, including through the publication of contemporary African poetry which alas, you can no longer read in African affairs, but you can elsewhere in the society's work. The society's activities were still dominated by debate about Africa amongst Britain's governing class, um, colonial elite, but the debate was no longer over how to rule Africa. It was how to manage its politics over which they were losing control and how to accelerate development for the benefit of Africans, not just the metropolis. Indirect rule gave way, gave way to gradualist reformism, which very rapidly gave way to just trying to manage the decolonization process. Colonial governors still paraded before the society's meetings, but to discuss the progress of their territory's development plans and the reform of legislative councils and local government to bring in African representation. The aim was to keep a self-governing Africa within the Western sphere of influence and out of Soviet clutches. 
The society's discussions show very clearly that Cold War politics and the British national interest remain central to the decolonization proce process until the end. The culmination of this shift in policy was summed up uh, in a speech to the society on the 13th of April, 1960 by Harold Macmillan, just back from his winds of change speech in South Africa. It would be foolish, he declared, to try to conceal the fact that our policy and that of the South African Union government differ widely, even fundamentally. Apartheid, he said, was wrong and unworkable. Decolonization, he claimed, was the triumph of Britain's own policies of promoting majority self-government and meant that, unlike the Austro-Hungarian or the Ottoman empires that had left anarchy and chaos in their wake, Britain left Africa both friendly and stable. This, at least, was the official version, designed to assuage conservative voters for the loss of their beloved empire and, like Dunkirk, make retreat sound like victory. In 1954, Swansea left to run Ghana's nascent broadcasting corporation, and his successor at African Affairs, Alan Gray, focused increasingly on the role of Africa in domestic British politics. Never before or since has Africa taken up so much parliamentary time or so much press coverage as during this decade of decolonization from 1955 to 1965. For a while, the Royal African Society was at the center of political action. African political leaders began to outnumber colonial governors of speakers, Tom Mboya, Kenneth Kaunda, Julius Nereri, loads of Nigerians, all spoke in the 1960s and 70s. But why have I dwelt so much on the colonial past? For two reasons. Firstly, to illustrate what is sometimes denied, that the empire was an enterprise based on underlying assumptions of Western and white superiority over Africans. The written evidence is crystal clear. It was so, and we must be honest about that. The record also shows examples of officials who are scrupulous, honest, well-intentioned and hardworking in trying to improve the lot of Africans they ruled. But both the power and the definition of knowledge lay firmly with those who did the ruling, ultimately a government based on conquest, not consent. Only in acknowledging this can we properly repent of the bad aspects and celebrate the good. I will return to this. Secondly, however, it also demonstrates that from the outset, African voices were included in the society's activities and its journal. It may at times have been a, a thin thread in the 20s and 30s, but it was always a crucial one. And the society was one of the few places in British, that the British establishment had come to hear African views from Africans. That was the first 60 years. In the 60 years since independence, things have become more complex and more interesting. The decolonization of the British Empire led also, in a sense, to the decolonization of the Royal African Society. There was no option. But the form and extent of this process needs examination too. Did the end of empire bring a change of attitude as well as political fact? Did it fundamentally shift the balance of power economically and politically and intellectually? Uh, what did the society do? And you can look at this in a number of ways. There's a, the post-colonial view that nothing has really changed. British attitudes to Africa remain much the same, dominated by negative stereotypes, hopeless Africa, as the economist once called it, and a romanticization of the European counter in an out of Africa sort of way. So real decolonization has yet to be achieved. There's an alternative, what I call the post-independence view, which I find more frequently in Africa itself, that uh, self-government was a genuine liberation. African people and African leaders achieved agency and sought to build their nations and assert their role in the world. But circumstances, including the colonial legacy, hindered that progress. There is a third, what I call not very post-imperial view, that the empire was in balance a good thing and things only went off the rails afterwards. There are quite a lot of facts that argue against that view. How did the independence, how did independence impact on the society's role and membership. In the 1960s, there were about a thousand members of the society, former colonial and government officials, businessmen with an interest in Africa, a growing number of academics, students, activists, and Africans. Its objectives now were, quote, to foster and encourage interest in Africa, to form a link between those who are or have been concerned with Africa, and to assist the study of African affairs in the UK. Two things happened. Firstly, there was a major row over Southern Africa. 
When Rhodesia declared UDI in 1965, the pro-Rhodesian chairman, Lord Milverton, was ousted and replaced by a more liberal businessman. And even more important, during the infamous 1970 South African cricket tour, a vice president of the society who publicly defended apartheid was forced to quit by an alliance between the academics and the respected elders, such as Marjorie Perham. The society aligned itself firmly with independent Africa. Secondly, the society distanced itself from government and became increasingly dedicated to the academic study of Africa. Successive editors of African affairs professionalized its academic output and focused on trying to understand and explain what was happening in the new nations of Africa. The 1960s and 70s were the heyday of academic Africanists, many challenging the inherited orthodoxies of the colonial era. The society worked in close alliance with the African Studies Association in the UK to strengthen its academic credentials and its financial independence. When I first joined the society 40 years ago in 1980, I was researching uh, African history at the University of Dar es Salaam. And there, it has to be said, the successors of Walter Rodney, of how Europe underdeveloped Africa, certainly believed that they were successfully decolonizing the African curriculum there, and that this was a change that would not be reversed. Even so, the society was still fundamentally about Africa rather than of Africa. This changed with the new millennium. Uh, and it was greatly accelerated by the appointment in 2002 of Richard Dowden as the society's first permanent director. He was already a well-known journalist. He was able to mobilize more funding uh, and a larger staff and expand the audience for the society's work. He was in fact key in transforming the society. African affairs itself became increasingly international and a conscious effort was made to increase the number of African authors. You were there at the time, Nick. In 2012, an African Authors Prize was initiated to encourage contribution from the continent. And in 2017, it appointed its first African editor based on the continent, Peace Medi in Ghana. African Arguments was created as both a book series and later from 2011, a website, specifically to challenge received views uh, about Africa. And uh, mainly African journalists, African academics, politicians, experts would publish on economic, political, social, and cultural affairs. In 2020, under, it has to be said, the inspired editorship of James Wan, it reached a global audience of around 3 million users, half of these in Africa. The society also re-engaged with public policy by acting as the secretariat for the all-party parliamentary group for Africa, one of the largest APBGs in parliament. Organizing a series of hearings on political development issues gave African speakers and Africans in the diaspora a chance to interact directly with British parliamentarians. This brought key issues to the political table. Most recently, the conditions of post-Brexit trade with Africa, mental health treatment in the, on the continent, the difficulties faced by Africans in getting visitors visas to come to the UK, and most recently initiating an inquiry chaired by Lord Paul Berting into how Africa is represented in the British school curriculum. Again, from 20, 2005 to 2015, regular business breakfasts were held to attract corporate members to hear an impressive array of African finance ministers, business figures, central bankers and economists. And since 2011, it has organized an annual lecture, the first lecturer being the former UN Secretary General, Kofi Annan. But the biggest change was the initiation in 2011, which is basically an annus mirabilis for the society. It organized its first film festival, Film Africa. And the next year, it inaugurated Africa Rights, the literary festival. The inaugural keynote speech being given by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. This decision, to promote African culture in the UK brought the society directly and deliberately into contact with the growing African diaspora community in the UK, particularly its younger members. And I should pay tribute to the central role played by Sheila Ruiz in developing both festivals. The society is no longer about Africa, it's increasingly of Africa. And this change is reflected in the new objective the society has set itself this year, not merely to promote Africa in this country, but to ensure that African voices are at the center of British and global conversations. So what now? History is all about people and fundamentally about the movement of people, 
Ultimately, we all came from somewhere else. It's just a question of how long ago. The history of the society reflects this, and so does the future. In Britain, the empire re returned home, not just the rulers, but the ruled. African, Indian, Pakistani, Caribbean, Australian, Irish communities are now an integral part of what Britain is. As Ambalabana Sivanandan put it, we are here because you were there. Colonialism left a heavy legacy in Africa of languages, laws, customs, connections. But it also created a legacy in Britain and an extraordinarily dynamic one. I would argue that it is no coincidence that it is the diaspora communities that are amongst the most industrious, energetic and creative in this country. We see this at Africa Rights, and everyone sees it in sports, in theatres, in films, music, fashion, on television, in all forms of media, and in politics. Black lives matter here too. What this means for the Royal African Society is that it can no longer be just about the Africa out there. It is, has to be about the Africa in here too. And that's why our focus is on the African voice wherever it is and wherever it needs to be heard. So, I've argued three things. Firstly, we need to be honest about the past as a society and as a country. But this is liberating, not embarrassing, let alone unpatriotic. It's only with this kind of repentance and the forgiveness that we can understand each other and build a stronger relationship for the future. The Commonwealth War Graves Commission have recently shown the way. Secondly, Britain's relationship with Africa is special. A special I would say, is that with the US, another former colony that fought for its independence from Britain, based on kith and kin. It needs to be nurtured, not neglected. When Africa needs help, like now, to recover from the impact of COVID, we should be the first in line giving it, not taking our money back home. Thirdly, that Africa is now part of what Britain is. The people-to-people -people links are strong and lasting. British culture is indelibly influenced by African culture, not by appropriation, but by inclusion. These are three areas where the society is engaging today and tomorrow. We will continue to promote Africa, continue to amplify African voices, but we need your support to do that. So we are very keen to expand our membership and we plan over the next few weeks, watch this space, to introduce a new form of membership for those who want to participate and support our work in the cultural and artistic areas. It will be a bargain membership and I recommend it to everyone. So the story is not over yet. Thanks very much. Thank you very much Nick for that and um, really thought provoking uh, discussion. Indeed, I was very uh, delighted to be uh, replaced by Peace Medi when I stood down as editor of African Affairs. So uh, it's a personal kind of story for me as well and something I, I felt was very important. But and as you say, we, we haven't done enough, um, but things are changing in important ways. It is a sobering thought that 2017 was our first African editor of African Affairs. And I think uh, it's an important move that we've made, but we need to move further and move faster. So it's great to hear your thoughts about you know, that progress. It does remind us that things change. And I think your question at the end about what more can be done and how the audience today can help us think that through is particularly valuable. Uh, we're very lucky now to be able to go over to Professor Fumi Onansakin, uh, who's going to be able to provide some discussion comments, provide some additional thoughts and insights. After that, of course, we are going to come to you, the audience. So please do start putting your questions and answers into the Q&A box. Uh, Fumi, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nick. Uh, and thank you. Uh, actually, I, I have two Nicks here, isn't it? So, so. Um, I want to say thank you for this invitation. Um, I, I thought very carefully uh, before accepting the invitation because I wanted to be sure uh, that there was space for me to respond um, with my own uh, conviction. Uh, and I, I thank you, uh, Nick uh, Westcott, for sharing your, your thoughts and your paper uh, ahead of time. It made me reflect um, through and through about the kinds of feedback that I want to give. Uh, I think uh, really in your paper, in your lecture, you, you offer a wide ranging and honest, uh, you give an honest historical account uh, of the Royal African Society or the African Society as, as it initially was. So we have seen a, 
a movement, a, you know, a history in which there was at least an attempt at an authentic engagement with Africa, but we saw how rapidly that became captured uh, and became something that was in service of, of the colonial uh, project. Uh, so that support uh, for the interests of that colonial uh, project in Africa uh, characterized it for, for a while. But, but uh, I also noticed a shift over time in recent times uh, of truly wanting uh, to be a convener uh, of African voices. But I, I, in reflecting on your lecture, there, there are three questions uh, that I, I then asked myself. Uh, and I want to, let me share these questions now and then provide some uh, anecdotal uh, evidence to close off uh, my, uh, my comment, my commentary now. The, the first is this. Is the colonizing mission that the African society supported at some point in the course of its journey, is it not already accomplished by replicating the same colonial patterns in the colonies that even though they have received <laughs> for the past how many decades flag independence? Is that mission not already accomplished? Is it not living here uh, with us today? I, I leave that to my second comment. How can the RAS today act as the voice of Africans in the UK if it does not revisit its own history of service, uh, of being in service uh, of the colonial system. And you're, you are revisiting that history today. And it's just a matter of asking questions about what do we do together uh, going forward. But third and crucially to my mind really, is about Africans and the African uh, elite themselves. So question is, uh, are African elite as of today, of today themselves, are they not captured vessels? And, and are they not well schooled in the maintenance of colonized forms of knowledge? I think if we're going to be frank with ourselves, I include myself um, you know, in, in that category, by, you know, by the way, uh, of part of that African elite that must carefully <laughs> interrogate our own mission and whether we're true to the mission of decolonizing knowledge and indeed decolonizing the continent of Africa and doing that with integrity. So, so I, I just want to offer uh, a couple of reflections. If we look back, uh, all right, uh, at the impact of history and the impact of the captured minds and captured spaces, we still see today in the context of, uh, of COVID uh, that if you look at what is happening today in the, or at this period in, in the year of the pandemic, just think back, look back to 100 years uh, ago, 103 years ago, 102 years ago, when a pandemic ravaged the world. And then we can see some of the history that uh, has repeated itself and is repeating itself even today. So one is the degree of trust that was near absent in 1918, when you look at the colonies in South Africa and in Lagos, um, by the way, and we've had uh, African scholars document this history very well. There was a near absence, you know, uh, in fact, complete absence of trust as we have today between some people and between people, African peoples and the governments, all right? Due to colonial conditions at the time in which Europeans' lived, lives mattered more than African uh, lives. And so we need to ask whose lives matter more today uh, during this crisis. We see history repeating itself in many ways. Who has had to sacrifice more? And uh, we're seeing the vaccine nationalism uh, that is going on. We're seeing the vaccine diplomacy and the nature of, of, of that conversation around vaccines going on. And we can only see that the change uh, that has come is a matter of degree, not a matter of sub substance. All right, so even when it was clear, by the way, that the Spanish flu was deadly, people chose to conceal this or flee port cities like Lagos due to a lack of trust and suspicion of the intentions of the colonial government. So of course, there was recourse to co coercion at that time, forceful inspection of people's homes to see who carried the disease and to take them to isolation centers. And this foiled the mistrust. Today's stories of police brutality in Nigeria or in South Africa in part, um, you know, are an indication that sadly, the infrastructure of leadership that was gifted by the colonial system 
remains intact in many respects, and you see it in the ways in which the security establishment um, operates. That's a clear inheritance uh, from, the, from the colonial system. Let's look at uh, the double-edged sword uh, nature of places like RAS and the societies uh, uh, in a sense that look like this. And that's the conversation we should have today. So, so today's call for the decolonization of knowledge and particularly the decolonization of the academy uh, makes this lecture very, very relevant. And thank you um, again, Nick, for your frankness uh, in the way that you, uh, what you chose from what um, uh, Inandi Azikwe um, wrote at the time, which remains valid today. And when you look at Walter Rodney's own history and the kinds of environment we're trying to create, that he was trying to create um, in, in Tanzania, uh, in Dar es Salaam at the time, uh, we're still where we are today, that we're still asking about the nature of the academy. Uh, and I think it's important to, therefore, uh, as I try to close these comments, what the African elite, uh, represented by those of us that are experts in the UK, as you try to make the area something different uh, today, we need to ask ourselves the questions about whether we're still trapped in the mindset that sees everything Western as holding more validity than our own lived realities and knowledges. And of course, we're talking to different um, African elite systems because we've become globalized in the diaspora. And this is where I acknowledge the work of people like Peter Da Costa, who talked about those of us in the Western Academy, Africans in the Western academies, who therefore need to question ourselves about the forms of knowledge that we create and that we build. And I want to conclude uh, by just raising two questions that you, I hope, uh, in collaboration with many of us can take forward, that if, we, if we're thinking about the realities of a common future uh, that uh, will make the Royal African Society serve the kinds of ideas and knowledge, knowledges that are African born uh, or led, the nature of the, the knowledge that is produced and reproduced um, in African uh, affairs and similar places must be re-examined and must be done with integrity. And the commitment of African experts themselves, whose voices will be promoted by RAS, must be that that carries a, a critical voice and begins to challenge our own our very systems and the mindset with which we produce knowledge and engage the continent of Africa. I, I want to thank you for uh, giving me room to respond uh, to your lecture. And I think uh, that this is a new phase that we need to craft uh, together. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Lusakin, for those excellent remarks. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Nick is actually in the process of, of writing this up for a piece that will hopefully appear in the future issue of African Affairs. So this is actually your opportunity to shape the debate and shape the discussion. And I'm very pleased to see that some of you have put questions already in the q and I'm going to go back to Nick in a moment just to respond to those comments because quite a lot of issues have already been raised there. But I'll throw in a provocative one here, Nick, just to encourage the audience, which is given the spirit of decolonization, is it time that the word royal was dropped from the title? Um, over to you. Thank you. That, that's what they call a googly in uh, cricket. Um, I uh, thank you so much, uh, Funmi, for your comments, which I think uh, get to the heart of some of the matter. And there, there, but there are what struck me rereading the record was that a lot of the debates we're having today were very live in the 1960s, and this is why I refer to the sort of post what I call the post-independence philosophical approach, Africans said, we have independence, we must now use it. We must liberate ourselves from the colonial mindset, from the colonial structures. It was explicit. And you, we see in the record of the society, people saying, we must sweep all this away and start again. So what happened? Uh, why did that not happen, uh, given that not just Walter Rodney, but you know, uh, presidents, political parties, uh, African intellectuals and elite wanted to liberate themselves from what they saw as colonial mental shackles. Um, was it like the first African industrial revolution, the one that happened again in the 60s, but failed um, because it was never internationally competitive? 
And it raises the question of what, what is Africa's place in the world? It's not just the colonial relationship. There's a risk of becoming over-focused on the colonial relationship. It's a global question. And that, to some extent, was where colonialism came from in the first place, that uh, the African societies and states that existed were not strong enough to resist the forces of globalization, which came in the form of colonial people with a maximum gun, missionaries and preachers, that, that this was a force that overpowered the structures that existed. And the question is how to build, therefore, structures that allow Africa to assert its, its role in the world. And, and this is a continuous process. And the colonial relationship complicates that. Um, but if you focus solely on that, if you're only looking at decolonization, then my view is you're actually missing a very important part of Africa asserting its voice in the world, in the globe, the world as a whole. How does Africa fit into the way the world works? Because it's also about their relationship with China. It's also about the relationship with India. Uh, and decolonization alone doesn't address all these issues. Um, so, it's an important perspective, but it can't be a sole perspective. Um, briefly on your uh, googly, Nick, um, I argue that Africa is now part of what Britain is, and it's, it's integral, and we need to recognize that. The royal is also an integral part of what Britain is. We happen to have become royal. Uh, and it doesn't really change things if we drop the royal. Uh, it's, you know, we, we need to reflect the whole. And the whole includes the old, the past, the royal, as well as the African and the modern and the new and the artistic. And it, it's part of our mission to try and bring these together. And it's in, important, I, I mean, our royal patron supports the work we do, which I've described what we're trying to do. And I see uh, that as a real asset to have the Duke of Cambridge engaged in the work we're doing. I think that will be a good thing for the country. Thank you. Um, just, we have a question from Roman, which is not so much uh, for you, but it's for the audience, which is Roman says it would be nice to know how many African countries are represented on the call today? So if anyone in the audience uh, is from an African country and would like to post, if you post into the chat, we will see it. I think you will be able to see what others within the audience also post. We can see who is represented on the call. Um, just one quick thought for me before I ask another question and go back to Fumi for her response. I think one of the things that we also have to recognize is that the way the world is set up, and I mean here both academia and policy and journalism, is that you know, we are asked to be competitive. We are asked to do better than other people. We're asked to publish in higher ranking journals. We're asked to publish our you know, blogs in more read places. We're asked to get on CNN or the BBC by our universities. And I think one of the things that we have to recognize is that, that that pressure, that encouragement to do that, that way of advancing your career as an academic in the US or the UK, can often lead you to crowd out spaces for Afri academics coming from Africa who don't necessarily have as easy connections, who don't necessarily have as high profile. And I think that's something certainly myself in, in my career I've sometimes been guilty of. And I think it's, you know, we, one of the things I think that spaces like RES can provide is, is an opportunity to have big, bigger, I think, more structural questions and conversations about how do we actually put that right? How do we actually create a situation in which academics around the world are not kind of competing for space. Uh, you know, a competition in which academics based in the West are almost always going to have more resources at their disposal to win. And how do we actually create a very different kind of environment where, you know, what academics in the West are actually thinking about doing is not getting more column inches than somebody else, but facilitating somebody else to have those column inches to say their truth and to speak their voice. And I think that's a very sort of significant shift in the way that academia is structured and the way that journalism is structured. And that to me at the minute is a major barrier 
to a genuine decolonization, um, much broader than you know anything like you know African affairs or the World African Society, but in the very fabric and structure of the way we've constructed our industries as these kind of competitive places. And I think we need to start working back against that and pushing back against that to genuinely have sort of decolonization. And I see RAS, you know, with your comments today, Nick, as a space where we could start to have those kinds of thoughts and conversations. Um, now, one of the questions we have in the audience, and please, everybody, please do start putting more questions into the Q&A so that I can ask them. Um, so here we go. Tom asks, how can we facilitate the public understanding of Britain as a rump empire state where Africa and other parts of the world are now part of who we are in Britain? It is not entirely understood, unfortunately, as education on the subject is clearly inadequate. So there were two aspects I quite like to this. One, I think, you know, perhaps a suggestion here that the UK overestimates its significance to the rest of the world quite consistently, but also Tom's connection of that to education. Um, and I wonder whether both of you might say something about that, but also uh, for me, feel free to respond to what Nick was saying just a moment ago. I think you might be on mute, yeah. Yes, right, no, no, thank you. Let, let me go back. I think that these are really interesting questions. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Nick. When I want to return really to this question of, you know, what we mean by decolonizing um, or decolonization. Of course we cannot say, and I don't think anyone uh, is seriously referring to anymore in its mod modern usage um, about the, the space question, of course, Canada and Australia and other people might still be talking about the question of place. When you're talking about Africa in particular, we need to take two things into consideration. The systems that persist. We can take the justice system as an example or take the entirety of the security system. The second thing is a form of knowledges and the institutions that sustain that knowledge. So uh, even Nick, uh, Nick Cheesman, as we are talking about academics and what it is that we privilege, uh, the fact that Africa today is not self-confident, and I'm speaking about Africa con collectively, there's no point uh, in separating South Africa or the odd or the few countries that seem to be uh, making some progress when it comes to some, not, you know, not, not a whole deal of progress when it comes to uh, systems and you take education for that matter, the way we think about methodologies, the way we frame, much of that framing has been set uh, in a particular institutional mindset because those are the things we inherited. And the reason, the fact that Africa is not self-confident is seen in the parading of uh, the continent before, if it's not the UK, it's going to be China, it's going to be France, uh, the speaking with an African voice is not always clear, not with clarity, because the power dynamics and the privileges that sustain systems that are not inherently African-led or even African-made, uh, that persists. For as long as that persists, I don't think that really we can be talking about a Britain and Africa that will be uh, relating on equal terms. It will not be equal until Africans, in terms of the educators, the researchers, the knowledges, um, the institutions, we design something that works for them so that they can speak on an equal footing. So when, when RAS is doing what it does, my challenge actually is to the Africans uh, that are part of RAS to be able to be bold enough to begin to craft the forms of knowledges that will speak to the African, to Africa's realities. And I don't think we are there yet. Uh, you can begin to see in the sorts of things that are written that we are trying to do that. And that takes me back to Nick Chisman's point about the pressure on academics in, in Western universities in particular. I think this is a global thing. And we have to make difficult choices. Uh, I, I mean, I, I sit uh, as part of senior leadership in an institution where uh, we find ourselves responding uh, to particular statutory processes and the fact that it has taken uh, for, for the research excellence framework to ask questions about impact for many of our universities to shift. And this is what we need to be investing some time in. Otherwise, we will create academics that are very far from the realities of their societies. And that social contract needs to change. And if RAS is going to turn a new page, it needs to speak to the social contract between us uh, as intellectuals, Africans, Europeans, 
people want to speak to the realities of Africa. Uh, and it's difficult sometimes we have to ask whose interests we serve. Uh, because until we ask that, until we make a decision that we want to firmly be on one side of history, one side of the realities, we may not be able to deal with that problem. So I think uh, decolonizing is still very legitimate, but in a different way when we're talking about Africa. Thank you so much. I just want to take a moment to recognize that. So today we have people from Ghana, Kenya, Nigeria, Eritrea, South Africa, Zimbabwe, uh, Kenya again, Nigeria, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, all of those people on the call, and I'm sure a few more besides. So thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Uh, I'm going to give the final word to Nick, uh, both perhaps Nick to wrap up and give your final thoughts on uh, what Fumia said, what the, the Q&As, there were some questions I wasn't able to ask. And perhaps you'd also like to take the opportunity just to flag for people that this is one of a series of events and there will be more events coming up as the RAS celebrates its 120th year. Yeah, thank you very much, Nick, and thank you so much, Funmi, for your uh, really uh, profound reflections there. Um, to answer Tom's question, uh, I think we need to begin at the bottom, and we do need to reform the British curriculum so that there is an acknowledgement of Africa as it really is, and as an integral part of what Britain is becoming. And that's what this review that Paul Boateng is, is chairing is about. You've got to begin at the bottom. You've got to have people who arrive at university thinking Africa is uh, valid, it's important, its voice matters, and its voice is part of Britain's voice now. Uh, and you, know, you saw that at, the, uh, at last at the BAFTAs uh, just last week. So um, we have to begin with education. There is a big issue over whether the, the African elite has been westernized, and that is in a form of decolonized because the Western Academy is so dominant. But is, is it the Western Academy? Is it a global academy? And in building a more balanced relationship, again, this is something where I think SOAS are beginning to look, and, and a number of British universities, you need an equal partnership with institutions in Africa so that we can support their work, they can support our work. It's a two-way process. And uh, that it becomes a more integrated process so that uh, Africa's voice is an integral part of what becomes the Global Academy. Um, and uh, Mutoni Wanyeki uh, asked about, you know, who is the Royal African Society's equivalence in Africa? Who can we partner with? And it is largely uh, ac academy, but it's also now cultural organizations. And, and here we are the subordinate, we are the recipients of the fantastic creative outpouring from Africa. Um, well, we are a vehicle, we're a platform on which that can be brought to British and global attention. And that's, so we are looking to partner with a lot of cultural organizations as well as the academic ones. This is where, where the society has diversified. I'm afraid I can't speak to the, for the French as one anonymous attendee. They'll have to speak for themselves on this. They're, they're a different kind of challenge. Um, but here in, in the UK, I am quite positive that we can and are beginning to address some of these issues. And the Royal African Society, I think, has a positive role to play in pressing that forward. You can hear yourself both what British and African ministers think about this long-term question. And next week on the 17th of June, we're having a panel discussion featuring the British Minister for Africa, um, uh, James Dudridge, and the Kenyan Minister, Monica Juma, who some of you may know, and uh, two academics, Alex Vines from Chatham House uh, and from the ISS, uh, Fonte Akum. So we have both the thinkers and the political actors, and I will be very interested to see how they address some of these questions and I hope many of you will join us again next week but thank you very much I there are many more questions here but I think this is a debate that will continue for a long time absolutely before we wrap up a number of people are asking how they can find out about the membership option that you mentioned and you teased uh, ah. is is that going to be put up on the RAS website is the way that our audience can find out because I think you might have some new members today Absolutely. Well, they're very welcome to join at the current rate. 
but if they hold their breath, breath um, they can get a, uh, an economical option uh, next month, it will be, and it will be on our website. We will, don't worry, we will headline it. Um, perhaps, Hodder, you could put just the link to our website uh, in the chat so that people know where to find us um, and uh, watch this space. And next month, the opportunity will arise and we'd be delighted to welcome as many of you as want to join. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone for joining us today. I think you'll agree it's been an absolutely fabulous discussion. Um, just to, you know, to end with perhaps two thoughts. One, I think clearly one of the things we need more of going forwards is just this kind of listening and dialogue between people you know, about what decolonization means, what it means for organizations like the Royal African Society and the African Affairs. So I would like to thank you know, the Royal African Society and Dr. Nicholas Westcott for putting this event on. I'd like to thank Professor Fumi Onisakin for her excellent comments and inspirational uh, insights today as well. Um, and I think the other thing that perhaps we need to encourage more of, uh, going back to you know Mathoni's excellent point, and she's she's always on the money, um, is you know what do we need? Do we need a sort of Royal African Society for Kenya, Royal African Society for Zimbabwe? Whether or not we need that, I think one thing we do want to encourage is scholarship and commentary around Africa of the UK and America. You know, I think we've all had enough of the time when British academics, British thought leaders, British journalists write about Africa, uh, and we need to encourage more African authors to write and critique and engage with British and American politics and society. I think African Arguments is already a great you know, facilitator of African voices and publishes great research from across the continent, but I think our Royal African Society could also play an interesting role in sort of reflecting that light back and asking you know our colleagues in Africa what insights they provide us because I think that's when you get that genuine conversation that actually this isn't the sort of former metropole critiquing the colonies this is a genuine conversation of intellectual equals in which we have mutual learning on both sides and I'm sure that in the next 10 years that's one of the things that we will see uh, the Royal African Society you know facilitating more and more of those genuine conversations and I think under your leadership Nick we've already started to see that so um congratulations on that thank you for a wonderful lecture thank you to the the audience and uh, this I believe the recording of this will be made available online so you've enjoyed it yourselves please do bring it to the attention of everybody else uh, and thank you very much have a good night thanks so much Nick thanks for me thank, thank you so much thanks Nick and thank you Nick bye